Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It is September 24th, 2024. This is the 6.30 meeting, uh, regular meeting of the Community Resources Committee. Uh, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public is possible, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. I would like to call the meeting to order with a uh, roll call. Um, uh, Councilor Haneke, please. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Thank you. Jennifer Taub. Here. Parque Ette. Present. And Pam Rooney is here. Thank you. We are all accounted for. Um, um, excuse me, Pam. Would you yep. like me to bring Stephanie in now? Yes, or? please. I mean, we're not quite at that item, but yes, certainly. Okay, there she is. Okay, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. And Chris and Stephanie, thank you for joining us tonight. You're welcome. I'm going to, um, so we're going to open it for public comment. This is the normal public comment period, um, after which we will address the agenda items. So let's see what we have for participants and attendees. I see one hand in the audience, and I would ask if Martha Hanner can please be brought in for Martha. This is to address um, public comments on matters within the jurisdiction of the CRC. You're welcome to express your views for up to three minutes. And uh, we do not typically engage in a dialogue or comment raised during public comment. During the public comment period, uh, we will recognize members of the public and when called upon, you can identify yourself by stating your full name and district or address. So Martha, please. Thank you, Martha Hanner. It's my understanding that you plan to go through this poor mangled solar bylaw line, line today. And so please let me remind you of the four criteria that you should be using to evaluate as you go through. First, is it complete so that a solar developer can find all they need to know for their application? Second, does it reflect construction best practices to preserve soil, protect water supplies, manage stormwater, and prevent erosion? Three, does it support the science? And does it support Massachusetts climate plans and the land use documents and preservation of natural and working lands? And four, does it reflect our community values and the people who elected you. So please use those as guidance as you uh, go through this document. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Anyone else in the audience, um, the other member of the audience would like to speak, please raise your hand. I don't see a hand, so let's, let's go to our action items. The first item of business is uh, just a conversation about process and procedures for public comment during meetings so that we are efficient and effective with our time, but we also gather input that the public may want to share with us. So I open up the floor to comments. Mandy Johanneke. Thank you. I asked for this on the agenda because I've become increasingly concerned that the operation of our public comment periods, and I say periods, um, within the Community Resources Committee are straying from the rules of procedure and the Council's rules of procedure that the committees are obligated to follow per the rules of procedure. Um, particularly with respect to that the public comment period is intended to hear comments from the public but not engage in discussions or debate with the council. And the way these periods seem to be going specifically 
as it relates to not the general public comment period, but the period that um, the chair is adding to the various agenda items seem to be coming close to attempting to engage in dialogue or debate between the public and the committee. And that is just not what our rules say the public comment period is for. And I'd like more clarity on um, what we're doing with public comment. I also feel like when the president chooses to add a public comment period to a specific action item, they list it in the agenda so that people know that will be the case. And it seems like it's not being listed here. So it's not being given, the public's not being given transparency as to when and how they will be able to make public comments at our committee meetings. Thank you. I, I would like to point out that um, item 4B1, which is discussion of solar bylaw, does say public comment specifically on solar bylaw topics under discussion tonight up to two minutes. CRC may respond to questions, then continue discussion. So I was very clear that that opportunity existed um, per your suggestion that it be in writing. Jennifer. Um, yeah, so I guess I'd also like to get some clarification because I've been in other actual council committee meetings where if we have, if there's a specific question and somebody from the audience raises their hand because they have that response, I mean, it's happened even in TSO, the chair at their discretion can recognize someone to get a specific piece of information. So I just would like some clarification if if that is not allowed, because I've, I've seen that happen at, in other committee meetings. Councilor Haneke. That Actually, is allowed under the, that is allowed under the rules, um, but um, it is my understanding that this has not been the committee asking a question of a specific person in the audience that it knows is there. We've had our own staff here in the, room that can answer those questions that should be answering those questions and that the the recognition of those members of the public has been done um, in a way that is not necessarily fair to the other members of that committee that that person is was a part of. Um, and that's part of my concern is that um, at least as to the solar bylaw, and it's nothing, I want to say it's nothing about, against the person who's been commenting and coming. Um, those comments are valuable. It's just, we seem to be not transparent that they are being, that comments are being taken from committee members, former committee members of the solar bylaw working group, um, more extensively than our agenda items appear. And that seems to me unfair to the rest of the solar bylaw working group for not having that knowledge that they could potentially come to our meetings and be recognized. In the past CRC, when it has sought other members of other um, information and knowledge from members of the public have actually voted in CRZC as a committee to invite them to the discussions as panelists and participants, which involves then that a different level of participation. And it seems to me that we're getting, we're, we're coming close to a line where that might be attempting to be happening without a formal vote of the committee to allow that to happen. Thank you. Councillor Ete. Um, Mandy has mentioned several times uh, transparency. I think the way I look at it is more about equity, and I'll bring it from two sides. Mandy has also mentioned that part of the equity that might be missing is that if you have a group that has produced a report, and not everyone in the group is available for a meeting, what ends up happening is that whoever is present overshadows those who were not present. And so there is inequity in that positioning. But there is a broader inequity that exists 
with regard to the community, which is that if the community sees the agenda and sees only one period for public comments and for some reason might not be available at that particular time, they won't show up for the rest of the meeting and therefore they won't have an opportunity to um, contribute to the discussion. Um, so what could be done might be to explicitly point out those periods when they will be public comments and that can give opportunity for members of the community to weigh in, if not at the beginning, then maybe at um, the second period or the third period as the case may be. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, no, I would agree if, if it was indicated that there might be a second period for public comments. I guess I, um, it, my perception was when you had, the few times you had acknowledged someone from the audience, it was to share a specific piece of information, which, I mean, I, I don't see where that is problematic um, or, or violating our rules. And, you know, certainly, you know, I, I understand what um, Councillor Ette, when he says not everybody from maybe the Solar Bylaw Working Group can come and make public comment, the time might not be available, but certainly everyone in the community and certainly that group who was engaged in this for 18 months knows that it's on the CRC agenda. Um, and it, for whatever reason, I think only maybe one other person has, you know, they haven't chosen to come and offer public comment. Uh, but I do think that there is a distinction between acknowledging someone in the audience who has a specific, can answer a question versus public comment. I think we should be able to, you know, be able to be that nuance to make that distinction. Thank you, Pat. Yeah, I'm uh, agreeing about issues of equity and I, I'm thinking um, how important it is that we have some kind of ongoing consistency to protect ourselves as a committee and to support our residents and former committee members, et cetera. Um, you know, the, Steve, uh, there was a member of the public who was not a member of the Solar Bylaw Working Group, but was a member of the Energy uh, Climate Action Committee who attends regularly. I have a feeling he and I could spar and I would really enjoy it, but that's not why he doesn't choose to share public comment for whatever reason. Um, I know that he has affect his his ideas uh, have affected lots of community members, and that's a good thing. So in a certain way, he's an expert. But I don't think that I could support um, random people attending and having chances to speak when other people do not. Um, and, you know, I think I. I think the issue really is one of transparency and equity. Um, so and may I, I ask a may I ask a clarifying statement? So, if there are a few people in the audience and one of them has raised a hand and gets called on, and the other person is encouraged to raise a hand if he or she would like to speak and does not ever. Um, do I do I have an obligation to somehow think that calling on one of the two people is inequitable? When are you saying you'd be calling on them during the regular public comment period if they don't raise their hand? They, but during we're talking regular... about what's been happening is sort of a, a conversation back and forth. And I happen to like a lot of the opinions of some of the people and not others. So, but I think that we need to be careful about how we proceed. Uh, there's a tendency across the council and not just in this issue, but many issues of not following the rules and procedures that we've set up. Um, and I think that we need to really begin to practice that in our, especially in the smaller committees. Councilor Haneke. Um, to your to your question, I think 
part of my uncomfortableness has been with the fact Excuse that, me. Can you turn? Can you turn your volume up just a little sorry, bit? Sorry, I'll speak closer. Okay. Yeah, that's thank um, you. <laughs> I I think part to your question. I think part of my uncomfortableness has been what I've perceived as a random decision to go to public comment in a random time during the discussion based on when a person may raise their hand in the participant window, not a set. Um, so more of a response to a raised hand than a set decision at, you know, a set preset decision of after 20 minutes of conversation at the committee level, we're going to move to public comment or after 10 or when the committee has completely finished discussing and there are no more committee hands up, then we'll move to public comment. Right now, a lot of it seems like it is in response to that the, the public is driving when to go, not, not the other way around. And the rules say after the counselors has, have had an opportunity to speak, you may have uh, allow for comments from the public related to a specific agenda item. And I'm just not clear on how that decision to, in some sense, I've felt has been very interruptive of the committee discussion to move to comments from the public. And I never know when it's coming other than it'll come at some point, but it seems very random on when that point is chosen. Um, and so more, more knowledge and preface of it's gonna be after 10 minutes or it's gonna be after 30 minutes or it's gonna be when all the hands are up. Um, or you know, if it's our last agenda item, I have to stop the discussion because we're gonna have public comment. And so I have to discuss it 20 minutes before the end of the meeting, no matter whether hands are up or not, so that there's time for that not necessarily as a reactive to, oh, someone raised their hand in the audience because they want to respond to something that was said and we're going to go right to them. And that's where I've, I, I guess that's some of what I've been feeling has been the decision-making and that's made me uncomfortable. Thank you. Um, Councilor Ote. I could speak after David. That's fine. Why don't you go ahead and then I'll call on David. I just had a quick announcement, Pam, just for the whole committee that I am going to, I need to go to the regional school committee to make a presentation. I'm going to leave my screen on or, yep. and I, I hope to be back in soon. Thank you. And um, can I assume that Athena is here if we need to call on her? You're muted. Um, I, I, I was just uh, listening in. I didn't mean to to butt into your committee meeting. If you have questions that I can address, I'm, I'm happy to do so. But okay. I am um, it, it, having dinner, so it might take me a moment to unmute, so I'm not chewing into my microphone. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't know if you were here officially, unofficially, because um, you don't usually play that role. So if we if we have a question and we might come to that, um, we'll, we'll give you a moment to chew. And of David. course, on the solar bylaw, Stephanie and... Chris are here to support yes. you. Yes. I Thank hope you. to be back soon. Thank you. Good luck. So what I've heard, if I can sum up what I've heard, is that in part it is the, the um, impromptu nature of the calling on people for follow-up conversation um, that is making causing some discomfort. It's not necessarily the fact that it is not allowed to have additional feedback on a particular topic in a committee meeting like this. So um, the, the um, allowing a speaker to raise a hand in a prescribed format at a prescribed time is something that people would um, would find more comfortable. So if, for instance, we said, we're going to be discussing solar bylaw for roughly an hour. At the end of that hour, we're gonna pause, we're gonna have uh, you know, any, any opportunity for public comment, uh, specifically on solar bylaw, uh, does that make people more comfortable? Councilor Ette. 
is I think some explicit notification prior to the meeting would be helpful. But in addition, I think we need to distinguish public comments from questioning. That is, if you create a space for people to speak, then anyone should be allowed to speak. But in raising a question from someone in the audience, that gives privilege to the person in the audience, which in a way means that it isn't public comment. To put it a different way, everyone who should make public comments would be equal but by asking a question and having someone answer, that gives preference to one member of the public over another. Would I be able to tell if someone was going to ask a question or make a comment when I call on them? You know, I'm going to make a real quick suggestion <laughs> to Chris and Stephanie. Uh, go away for a few minutes and come back. It feels painful to have you two sit here, but I think what we're discussing is important. I'm I'm giving it another five minutes max. Okay. Is that okay? If you want to yeah. take a break, great. Thank you, Pat. I thought you were gonna. I thought you were gonna help out Councilor Ete with his formulation of a. I did have a, I, I won't call it a formulation. So the public can speak on anything and they could ask a question, but in answering a question from the public, then that easily becomes a slippery slope in which you can have a tete-a-tete -tete and it is um, an answer back. And so preserving public comments where we are not responding to the public, but listening to what their input might be on an issue is what is important. I don't know if this makes sense. That is, it doesn't matter if the comment has a question or not. What matters is what the council's response to the question or comment from the member of the public is. So what I think I'm hearing is that if I call on someone on a specific topic, so this is in a very specific, related to a, the specific topic that's being discussed, and I made this the comment to the point, um, please please phrase your concern or or thought as a comment rather than a question, because there are people who don't want us to be answering questions directly and having a back and forth conversation. Does that make you more comfortable? I'm getting real confused now, and I'm sorry, uh, Councillor Ate. I'm interrupting, and I can wait. I'm sorry. I'm gonna I'm gonna call on Chris. I just wanted to say that I think it's legitimate to ask questions during public comment, but you don't have to answer them. When somebody asks a question, we write down the question and then later on in some future meeting, we provide an answer to that question, maybe or maybe not. But it's completely legitimate for someone to ask a question during the public comment period, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Stephanie. Um, I don't know if this is helpful, but I think maybe some of the discomfort is um, perhaps that a member of the public is representing the committee when, uh, and I know at times they have said they only represent themselves, but they're being recognized by certain members of this subcommittee as experts and representing that group, that working group, when really it should only be looked at as comments from a member of the public not specifically representing the group because they were never designated to be the representative of the group in any follow-up procedures or a review of the bylaw. So it's really, it isn't fair. And the, there are people, you know, on the committee that would probably, in the working group, I'm sorry, that would come, but, you know, they're very busy and they have children or they're just, their lives are very busy. So I think, um, 
I just think it's it to be careful. I, I think that might be some of the discomfort and the the distinction that's not being made that needs to be very clear. Thank you. We'll go back to Councillor Ette, and then we'll wrap it up. We'll see if I can summarize. Um, I think nothing I've said precludes a member of the public asking a question and frankly, the council responding. We just can't respond in real time during the public comment. That I think is what I've um, tried to say. The, the period that is specific for public comment is one where the public gets to speak. And hopefully once we have those specific periods laid out in an agenda, that might be helpful for members of the public who may choose to show up or not show up during those specific periods. Good, thank you. So tonight it was laid out in the agenda. It didn't give a specific time. And if that is the case, then I think in crafting future agendas, um, I can do a better job of attaching a time frame and a point in time that it makes um, that there's some logic to calling on public audience input. Um, I I appreciate the fact that questions are okay because I I agree with that and that we will be careful not to try to have a back and forth. And I see Athena, who is the expert, raising her hand, so thank you. I can't help myself, I, I just, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I just Go wanted to put, a, put out a suggestion, but I, I think this is- You just cut off. Athena? Can you hear me okay now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. I was just saying that I appreciate the conversation. This has been really interesting to listen to. And I, I thought I would offer a suggestion because there is it, what sounds like um, a need for some public feedback and, and questions about what's going on. And uh, the committee in the past has done a listening session and a public dialogue session. So those special CRC meetings could be a special CRC meeting could be scheduled to um, to really get into that with the public rather than um, interjecting into the committee's process or you know having various so that it's more public that this this is what the purpose of that meeting is for we're having a meeting for information and um, if there are questions that we can answer we can answer them and so on um, and that might make it a more open venue for people to come and share their feedback and ask questions and so forth. Thank you. It's a great idea. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap that up. So um, we'll be more deliberative. Uh, we can talk about another any other kinds of uh, specific sessions that we might want to do, and we'll be more deliberative with the agenda setting, the time frames, and the opportunity for additional public comments specifically on um, the topic at hand. Everybody ready to move on to solar bylaw? Okay, thank you. And thanks for bringing that up. Action item 4B is the solar bylaw. Staff review um, input is coming, is coming. It has not been received. Um, the basis for their comments and for any work that we do is the zoning bylaw version four that was done on um, September 4, 24, and as sent to staff in our, in our document folder, in our meeting folder, it, the, the word document is listed as document with a one in parentheses. And that was a word version that uh, that Athena created for us for some for some reason we had an ODT version and I don't know how that got created. Um, it may just be a version that's on Stephanie or Christine's Microsoft Word program or something. So anyway, we have the version one. Um, 
I guess I'd like to, uh, if there's nothing else, I would like to open the discussion. Um, let me just quickly, excuse me, let me just check with Chris and Stephanie if we could get a quick update on when the staff comments probably are going to be available. Um, I would anticipate they'll be um, available for the next meeting. Okay. And that is on September, I mean, October 8. It would be very, very helpful if we could have them by the 3rd of October so they can go in the packet and into our Word, uh, our uh, meeting folder by Friday so that we have time to, to read what the staff has said in preparation for the meeting. Thank you very much for managing and organizing that. Sure. Okay. So, Mandy, I think you've got the version that we started out with. And, and I also want, as, as we start to bring this up, um, I have had a conversation with Athena and Dave Zomek, Chris Brestrup, Stephanie, about just uh, the, the process and making sure that we're very consistent with our process of updating. So similar to our work on the rental, reg reg rental registration and nuisance bylaws, we will be very carefully documenting the current draft. We will be bringing our own notes and, and ideas to the conversation, but we will not be sharing uh, written documentation before the meeting. Um, they, your written notes can be put, I'm, I'm, I think, can be put in our folder after the meeting, um, after it's been made public. Um, in, the, in the meeting process, I'm also going to make sure that we have the original document from the Solar Bylaw Working Group that is going to be in our folder each and every week as just a reference of where we started and what we have changed in the meantime. Once we have finished the discussion for a particular meeting, it will get dated and version documented, and that will be um, that will be placed in the. I'm going to be placing it in the folder for the following meeting, so we'll always have the latest version ready at hand, and I will be asking that Athena post. Obviously, for the next meeting, we'll have. The most current version. If there are, as we reach out to other counselors for comment on this bylaw, their comments will be consolidated and put in as a document um, to be posted to the public, and then it will be put in our packets as well for consideration. Um, Pat. Thanks. Uh, I'm a little confused. Uh, which is not surprising. Um, there's so many versions. But you know, I understand we're working from this version. If someone makes a suggestion and are we just putting it in the track changes? Are we actually going to vote on anything? Are we going to do anything? Or are we just making it more and more complicated to read? More and more complicated to read. What's the point of that, I guess? Um, because we are trying to we are trying to capture those thoughts so that we can um but we're capturing the thoughts we're sitting here talking back and forth uh we're going to go section by section that's right why can't we talk about it and see if we can come to agreement as a committee to what we're going to accept in you know and, and not necessarily in every section uh would we come to that although that would be lovely but I mean, I will defer to your process, but all I see is that we're creating a draft. We're creating uh, something that's harder and harder to keep um, referring to, looking at, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm, very, I'm very comfortable at the end of section 17.00 are we generally in agreement with the changes that have been made or the additions? Mandy. You're, You're muted. muted. 
sorry. I don't have a raise hand button as both oh. a screen sharer and a host. So yeah. I'm going to have to like raise my That's hand. Fine. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, I do have recommended changes to the incent intent and purpose section. Okay. No, that's what I'm saying is, is once we discuss, for instance, section 1700, let's talk about them and we can, if we can generally agree, great. So let's start with section 17.00, intent and purpose. Mandy, you, you, you raised your hand and you, uh, let's hear your comments. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll focus on the first paragraph. I have some comments about the second paragraph, but the first one to me is sort of the, the intent and purpose paragraph. The second paragraph isn't. So I'll, I'll, that that's completely different type to my, in my mind. Um, but the first paragraph focuses only on regulation. Um, and it doesn't talk about at all a need for balancing the need for renewable energy generation with a need to protect health, safety, and welfare. Um, it only says the article is to promote health, safety, and welfare um, through regulation, um, but not that we're trying to balance those two matters. And I think... I I've always been under the impression that the goal of this bylaw was or supposed to be um, that balancing of the need for renewable energy generation with the need to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the general public. And to me, the purpose of the purpose statement in this section does not do that at all and doesn't even address that issue. Um, the second issue is that it only talks about large scale ground mount photovoltaic installations. And I think it's now our thoughts that we might be adding a little more regulation for the balancing of those two items that I just talked about for battery energy storage systems. So we might want to talk about battery energy storage systems, not just in the title, but in the intent and purpose too. So yeah. I have a rewrite of that first paragraph um, that I won't type in now, but I can read, I can read it um, to see what people think about it for sort of a rewrite of the first paragraph. Okay. Um, and and I'm going to, I'm going to comment that, that I was thinking that we've got the the promote the health and promote the and regulate so i was also suggesting that we support the health and and safety by promoting because we're suggesting that we are promoting and regulating the creation of so i think we've covered some of the promotion part we're supportive of this um anybody else generally before and and including the the battery energy storage systems in there as well as lgpi i think is smart Anybody else have general comment before we hear Mandy's verbiage? Pat. Yeah, I I think I agree with you, Pam, that we are talking about promoting and, and regulating. Um, most bylaws are about regulation. That doesn't mean it's a negative. Uh, the other thing that feels important to me. Uh, is that we have, and we, we do reference battery energy storage in this bylaw, so adding it up there is probably fine. Um, but I, I also feel strongly that we need, and this town needs a battery storage bylaw. And uh, so, um, I don't know, I'd like to hear Mandy's rewrite, but I think it's pretty... I don't think it needs much rewriting at all. Yeah. I, I agree. Mandy, go ahead. So um, my rewrite is the purpose of this article is to balance the need for increasing renewable energy generation with the need to protect the health, safety, and general public welfare by providing standards for the placement, design, construction, operation, monitoring, modification, and decommissioning of large-scale ground-mounted photovoltaic installations, LGPI, and battery energy storage systems, BESS. Can you read it one more time? It would actually be helpful to me to see it, if that's possible, if it can get typed. Um... I 
I feel pretty comfortable with it. Um, Anyone and feel I that also way? think the Mandy's statement about balance um, supports the idea that we're not trying to stop solar developments. Um, and that and that's true. Um, and we're also trying to say to the state, hey, we're not trying to stop it. So I think that that is a good way to address it. Christine. I wonder if the mention of BESS here implies that the regulation of BESS will be in this Article 17, or if, um, as I believe, that should be in another article. If I could reply to that, I, I, it was sort of on your suggestion that, yes, we do need a separate battery storage, but that it's not on anyone's agenda right now. It's not on anyone's radar or workload. And that by incorporating it into this process, which is already underway, that we would be better off covering the base, um, even if it's not as complete as we might like. Does that does that ring a bell? And is and is that comfortable? <laughs> That is comfortable. Yes, thank you. Um, let's see. Anyone else have a hand up? Anyone, uh, Mandy Joe? Oh, sorry. I, my hand is up for the title of this section and then for the second paragraph. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, we normally title these sections purpose, not intent and purpose. Um, it's kind of do. Duplicative. We haven't, yeah, we haven't really described oh. intent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I would delete the intent and section like that and just call it the purpose section. Um, and as for the second sent the second paragraph, I guess it is, that's not really a purpose or an intent statement, although it says the intent sort of um is in there. That's more of an applicability that I think belongs in section 1701, not the purpose section that the provision set forth shall take precedence over all other less restrictive. I think that's more of an applicability, part of an applicability, what is it applicable to? Um, but I have a question about this wording. Um, the provision set forth in this article shall take precedence over all other less restrictive sections of the zoning bylaw in the regulation of LGPI. Uh, does that mean that if there is a more restrictive section somewhere in the zoning bylaw, that that more restrictive section applies? Um, so that just by that statement, this is not a standalone article at all. Um, and I guess that gets back to whether the intent of this article is to be a standalone article of this is the only place you look or whether we're going to be going and looking in other places because if it's mm -hmm. this is the only place you look um i think that sentence needs reworded and if it's not the only place it looks i think we need to be more clear about that yeah uh chris so I think it's not the only place you would look. For instance, there are um, regulations with regard to lot coverage um, and building coverage, which would also apply to these installations. And those are listed in Table 3 of Article 6. So that would also apply. And there may be other things um, that um, would apply as well. We haven't combed through the bylaw completely to discover what those might be. So this may need to be reworded to take that into account. So uh, can um, I, I ask would, another I, question? Yeah, I, let me just, if I could sure. just answer, I would I would support that, that sentence going into the applicability. It, it makes sense there. And if we just, if we can slide that down there for now, that
and we'll we'll hopefully get maybe some sense from from staff if um, if there are, as you said, less restrictive. I mean, I was thinking of a fencing section that that might be more restrictive than this, but um, I don't know. Does everyone feel generally comfortable? Oh, Mandy's with hand is up. Counselor oh, Hanneke's sorry. hand is up. Thank you. Thank you for watching. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, Mandy and then Chris. Yeah. So I guess one of the things I'm seeking clarification on is if there's a conflict, does it matter whether it's determined whether the conflict, whether the conflict means section 17 is less restrictive or more restrictive on to whether article 17 applies. So I'll take fencing. If this section, if this article has fencing in it and there's fencing in a different section, does it matter if, if one is, does it matter the determination as to whether section 17 or the other section is the more restrictive one as to which one applies or do we want, if there's a conflict, section 17 to apply. And and that's not how I read it right now. So I guess it's more of a, I think we need to decide what we want to apply and then rewrite this sentence to get that. Versus if something's silent in this article, which as as the uh, Chris, Christine just said, this article seems to be silent on lot coverage and building coverage, um, things like that. And so silence, might fall to somewhere else, but if this article had had a lot coverage limit, say, but on that lot coverage, say, is I'm going to pick a number that you guys are going to go crazy with, forty percent. But there's a lot coverage maximum in BG is of a hundred percent. Does BGs apply, or does the forty apply no matter what zone you're in? If you mention it here, do you, I, I, do you, I hope you're getting what kind of questions I have about this wording. Yeah. So my gut reaction is that that the provisions in this article take precedent relative to LGPI and BESS. That these are the standards that one would look for for this topic. And you, and not the word less get rid of the word less restrictive. It is just these are relative to this topic. Does that make more sense? It, it makes sense to me. I'm I guess I'm asking the planning department, Stephanie and and mm -hmm. Chris, as to whether that was their intention. Yes, that was our intention. Yeah. And BESS, yep, great. Anyone have any comments or feedback? I think that's a good placeholder for now. It might not be the best wording. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. Good. So people generally okay with these two sections? Well, no, my about... That's fine. Raise your hand. There's a um, in terms of applicability. Yeah. In the uh, I would like to change the word yeah. contains to applies. Yep. Um, very minor change, and then in the um, the bylaw is not in, in the second paragraph is not intended to regulate solar panels um, installed on buildings. Uh, and I would like to say, and on parking lot canopies. And then I and I want to check this with Chris. Uh, what I was going to add is such installations are permitted by right with a building permit. Chris. So I think this is different wording here, Pat, yeah. than you had in your version that you were working with. So I think we're saying what you wanted to say. 
This bylaw is not intended to regulate solar panels installed on buildings or parking lots. So solar installations on parking lots shall be considered an accessory use and okay. should be regulated based on the permitting requirements of the principal use. And to give you an example, if the Fort Rivers school came and wanted to put a solar... Oh, well, no, I understand that. I guess, yeah, Chris, so I, I think... understand. Thank you. And I remember our conversations. I would like, instead of on parking lots, on parking um, canopies, because that's where they would be, wouldn't they? The parking canopy, the solar panels would be on parking lots. Okay. Um, okay. That's minor. I'm going to make a suggestion that we combine these two, essentially the, the last half of the first and the second one. So we already say that in the first paragraph, this bylaw is not intended to regulate systems, or you could say solar solar systems. Systems That's of fine. No, roof mounted systems or solar parking canopies. Of less than 250 kilowatt direct current comma, roof mounted systems or solar parking canopies. So we've covered all of that. So yeah. the next okay. paragraph, we can get rid of the first sentence entirely because it is. Um, and then I'm gonna ask Chris, do we actually need to talk about accessory uses and and permitting, permitting requirements? Is that just assumed and known because there are other bylaws that cover those? Or is it is it appropriate and good to remind people here? I do you want me to answer that? Yeah, yeah if you would, then I'm going to call yes. on. So I think it makes sense to mention it here because people may be wondering, right. well, what about these other things? And if we say specifically that they're regulated the same way that their principal use is regulated, I think that helps people to understand what in fact is regulated here. Thank you. Uh, Mandy Jo. Um, a, another request, the bylaw is not intended to, seems vague. <laughs> I would reword it, the bylaw does, this, this, this section or this article does not, does not apply to, is what I would say. You can tell me to remove it if people don't like it, but but that's what I would say. This article does not apply to systems. systems. Yes, I think that's of less than so. So that that's mm -hmm. one of my, my first comment. Mm -hmm. My second is um, goes back to the use table, which I know we haven't looked at in a while, but the proposed use table that came along with this article. Um, had special permit across the board in all zones for both BESS and LGPI of um, just LGPI. No definition of what LGPI is in Article 3 in the use table that came along with this. Um, didn't have anything in that. And so a couple of questions about applicability and how that relates to the use table. Number one, if the definition for LGPI is only found in section 17, not in section 12, um, does it apply to the use table in section three or does it not? It's supposed um, to, but I understand <laughs> your question. Um, and number two, what about a small scale ground mount photovoltaic system given our use tables and our um our our interpretation that anything that isn't specifically mentioned in the use table gets the building commissioner in general says well it's closest to x use in the use table so that's the permitting requirements that apply so if small scale ground mount solar is not listed in the use table, does that mean it it would default to special permit across the board because that's the closest thing listing in the use table? Um, and does it matter that this says accessory use when there are some solar installations that are not 
parking lot as an accessory use is a roof mounted system an accessory use because roof mounted isn't listed this is only this accessory use only deals with parking canopies not roof mounted or small scale and so how does small scale and roof mounted systems get regulated given the use table in article three that only lists large scale and do they then default to large scale? Good question, Chris. Um, so that's a really good question. Um, I think that we didn't think about small scale um, ground mounted solar arrays because people were not um, expressing concern about them. Um, but to give you an idea of what they would be, it's probably something on the order of an acre worth of solar panels. So we probably should regulate those somehow, especially if they're not accessory uses. So that's a smart um, idea that we need to look into. And the other part of the question was, I forget the other part of the question. How are they permitted? Do they fall under the use table of large scale ground mount because they there is no small scale ground mount listing? Like right now, large scale ground mount fall under like utility connection or something yes. is, is how you determine it. Where would small scale fall under if we add a BESS and a large scale ground mount there without adding a use line for small scale ground mount? We should have a use line for small scale ground mount. And um, I remember what your other question was, how are roof mounted solar panels currently um, regulated? And they are regulated only by the building commissioner with a building permit. So you could say that they are a yes. If you wanted to add them to the use table, it could be um, added as a yes. Chris, is, sorry, is that the roof and and um, parking lot ones are a yes. No, only Just, the building, uh, only the roof mounted solar arrays are considered um, to be approved by the building commissioner via building permit. The solar arrays that are in a parking lot are considered to be accessory to the use, the principal use of that property. If the principal use of that property is a parking lot, well, that would be regulated in a certain way via the use table. If the principal use of the property is a school, then it would be regulated as schools are, are regulated. So it would be accessory use to the school or site plan review. Does that make sense? Yep. So so it sounds like we need to update table three in a in a in a further manner and include small scale projects and roof mounted projects I don't know if we need to okay so no no mounted. to the no to the to the roof mounted I'll cross that up just Wait. small scale we'll put small scale in the table yep and we'll also need to add small scale to our definition then I think so, there is a definition for small scale mm, that that oh, maybe brings me to the other question I asked that I, I'm not sure I heard Chris's with def, with a section with article 12 being definitions and this one saying this and and this applicable set applicability saying this section applies to LGPIs proposed to be constructed after the effective date and this section having the definition of LGPI and potentially small scale how does that relate to the use table that doesn't generally get its definitions from anything other than Article 12? Do we need to mo move those specific definitions into Article 12? I think you're giving a good argument for moving the definitions into Article 12. Just like we did the ma marijuana definitions. Oh my gosh. All in, mar in, all in the definitions section, you know, listed all together. So these should probably be all in the definitions listed all together. Excuse me, are you suggesting that all of our definitions go into sec a table to our section 12, article 12? That's the way it usually works, except in the case of flood mapping, when those definitions were contained within the flood mapping section because they are related to FEMA and the state um, regulations. But I think Mandy is making a good case for moving these definitions into Article 12, which is all the all the other definitions. 
I think we don't we have other don't we have other by like rental reg registration had its own little set of of definitions that were germane really just to that topic. That's in non zoning bylaws. Still, it's the same approach, Pat. Yeah, um, I hear what you're saying about definitions, but I'm also remembering a week or so ago where there was a sense of keeping as much as possible in here to make it easier for a developer to find everything. Um, and so I, I would defer to you, Chris, in terms of whether you think that developers of this kind of installation, which is newer, not completely, but would um, would know to look in the definitions elsewhere and all of that, probably, but. Uh. Yeah, Chris, thank you. I think they would know to look in the definitions if they had a question about something, yes. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna jot that as a suggestion to do. Any other any other comments on point oh one and point oh oh, Jennifer? I, I don't have a question on that, but I do have a question like for Chris. I'm just uh, curiosity. So for the Solar Bylaw Working Group, did they make a decision to keep definitions in here? I mean, have, did they discuss that and come to a different decision? May I answer that? Oh, sure. Yes. Yes. So I don't remember if they discussed that, but um, they weren't um, they weren't as knowledgeable about the setup of the zoning bylaw. They were mostly focused on how do we regulate these installations, and they were um, thinking about the substance of what we were okay. doing rather than where it would go in the bylaw. Okay. Thank you. So it wasn't they had made it. Okay. Thank you. So that moves us into section 1703 definitions. Oh no, excuse me. I didn't mean to skip over 02. Are there are there comments about the nexus statements? And as I understand it, again from that working group, that it was important to state for the benefit of the Commonwealth. Uh, and and any regulators that we are making connections between values that are found on uh, working lands, forests, and and farms or farm fields, and that we're trying to make a connection and and uh, in the value of uh, of those lands in our regulating. I had a I had a comment. I oh Pat, go, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You go ahead, Pam. Um, in some version that I saw, there was a really nice way of um, delineating the different sections in this under the nexus statement, and I saw the different the following topics. It was um, the topic of carbon sequestration, and then a little couple paragraphs. Climate resilience was the next topic. Um, community values was a third one, and an economy or economics was the fourth topic. And it made it made this uh, the flow of this chunk of material much more um, comprehensible to me. And I wondered if people would be willing to try that as a as a way to organize this section. Pat. Yeah, I, the nexus statements are important. Um, we heard that from Jonathan Murray from KP Law in terms of uh, um, what we need to do um, to include a, that justifies these regulations. Um, and it's because of a lot of other lawsuits. But when I looked at these, I feel, felt like I could edit them down by half and also some of them could be moved to other sections. I think they're very long. Um, so I don't know whether you want me to try and, and go through that now or. Um... Um, sure, if, if, if we could just maybe for my benefit, 
put those categories in as we come to them so that it helps me keep in mind what the topic is because it's um, it starts to blend together. Um, in the first, Mandy. Oh, oh, hold on, Mandy, you got your hand up. You're muted. Looking mm -hmm. at the comments to this section, um, I support Councillor Ette's comment um, of removing it. Uh, the planning director, Chris Brestrup's comment of con considering deleting these. Um, I find their statements somewhat of a stretch to connect things to health, safety, and welfare, particularly certain of the statements. Um, although I, I know, Pat, you've taken a, a shot at doing some sort of, I've, I've seen your draft, so, so a little shot there, and it's a little bit better, but... Um, we need to base everything in health, safety, and welfare. And I find some of the statements as to what public health, what relates to public health, a bit of a stretch. For instance. Um when we get to it, I I can I can talk about it. I know particularly some of the stuff under agriculture um, and things that bring out and point out certain businesses in town. Um inappropriate for a zoning bylaw. Pat? Well, I'm going to sit with the KP law as much as I respect and admire your uh, awareness of the law. I feel like uh, the removal completely of the nexus statements would be a major error mistake. Um, so basically, and I wish I'd gotten better approval about some of the changes I made, but let's look at them. Um, so in the very first where it says climate change um, is an urgent threat, and then I've crossed out necessitating rapid transition to renewable energy. Um, people can agree that with that. Uh, can I ask why you deleted that part because frankly right, I because it does necessitate climate change is an urgent threat but the maintenance of forest and and sequestration is also critically important uh, you know and somebody said in in I don't remember it might have been in public comment of, or elsewhere another time about the Amazon rainforest can carry all you know do that while well, the Amazon rainforest is being systematically destroyed so it isn't the the idea of rapid um, transition to renewable energy seems to me to be a drive that ignores other aspects of what we need to do to address climate change. Thanks. I'd like to also, as we're starting to go through Pat's comments, if we could just put in front of the word climate change, if we could please put carbon sequestration as the topic. Are you saying delete nexus statement for forest lands? No. I'm actually saying nexus statement for forest and farmlands. I'd like to combine them. I do that later. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. Actually, see, I've got three different things going on. <laughs> uh, yeah. The, what I'd like to do first is to change the title. The nexus statement regarding special requirements for LGPIs on farmland and forest lands. Yeah. And let me see. Uh, where am I? Uh, but, 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 let me see. Where it says, uh, not only must the town of Amherst replace the use of fossil uh, fuels, but, uh, but but must also increase the drawdown of greenhouse gases from the environment. But we must um, also increase the drawdown of greenhouse gases from carbon sequestration. 
is a key part of the Massachusetts climate goals. So, so changing that to a key part of the Massachusetts climate goals. And then um, it's really hard for me to see this. And to eliminate, uh, in order to achieve net zero admissions by 2050. You actually crossed that out. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Maybe I said it, in a, yeah, in order to achieve net zero admissions by, so to, re, yeah. Uh, let me see, I'm looking at this also. Recent research clearly shows that global climate go goals cannot be achieved without significantly increasing carbon sequestration period. And then uh, crossing out Massachusetts. Did you have the words climate. amount of global? Uh, amount of global. You kept that? No, I took that out. Okay, okay, because it wasn't taken it's, out. Okay. Yeah, it's really hard to do this. this yeah, way. I know. I'm sorry. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah. And then to uh, cross out Massachusetts, the next sentence uh, completely. And then um, in also, um, <clears throat> let me look here. So it should say, instead of in particular comma, it should be a capital forest and wetlands are key to carbon sequestration and storage, um, benefiting the health, safety, and welfare of our residents. Pat, can we add the word forests, farm, land, and wetlands? Be all right with me. Since we're talking about that, total category. Okay. I have another. Go ahead. Two yep, suggestions. Go ahead. Yep. Although I'm not sure what you all think about it. So the sentence that's about recent research clearly shows um, that global climate goals cannot be achieved without significantly increasing carbon sequestration. I would add at the end of that sentence, or significantly increasing the installation of solar and other renewable energy production systems. We can't do it without both. Well, then it might, then I'd agree to say and, but not or. Well, and is fine. <laughs> <laughs> but we can't do it with carbon sequestration alone. Yes. But this is without significantly increasing. Yeah, but I hear you. That would be all right with me. If we're here to balance... Yep. Um, that was that was my first comment, and my second comment um, was going to be to add at the end of this paragraph that LGPIs are key to generating sufficient renewable energy. What does sufficient mean? Because there's a whole all of if you don't wouldn't even need as many as if you were putting solar panels on every building and on every parking lot. And, you know, it doesn't, doesn't compute. All right, we were actually told that, that we have the capacity on our built lands to, yeah. to accommodate most of our needs. So I can't, I don't agree to that. I agree, so, Pat. I should raise my hand. Well, we're not voting, so I'm I not know. sure how to. No, no, I'm I'm okay with removing it if we can add some comment in here about um, figuring out a way to more promote what you just said. We can do it with somehow maybe adding regulations to require rooftop solar or well, except other it, it, things it, like that. Maybe it doesn't belong in here, which is why I said add a note to think about how we can yeah, but to me, do our mainly, zoning to promote those items if people don't yeah. want LGPI. To me, what you're saying is embedded in and in significantly increasing the installation of solar and other renewable renewable energy production systems, because that's small, um, yeah. So to me, it's there, it's embedded there. It looks like that's big, small, and otherwise. Chris Brestrup, sorry, I keep forgetting to call on you. I just wanted to say in response to 
um, the statement that we have enough um, developed land and buildings to um, provide all the solar that we need. Um, there's a an element of property rights in here. And do you, you know, force people who have buildings or land to install solar on their buildings and property? I feel like there may be these places in the state where installations could be placed, but there has to be a, a willingness on the part of property owners to do this. And that's where I, I question what the state has, um, has, has stated about mm -hmm. how much land is available or how much property is available to right. install these things. Yeah. No, you make a good point, Chris, because I don't think you can force everybody to do what might benefit the, the whole. But it also seems to me that um, not saying that makes it seem like, so we can get rid of forests. We can, we can, you know, and nobody's quite saying that, but, you know, there have been plenty, there's been plenty of pushback from, uh, with people saying, oh, well, we cut down all these trees for housing developments. So why, you know, why can't we cut it down for solar installations? Those are different private and personal uses. But the other thing for me is um, we have, we can address, we can begin to address in terms of how we site homes. Um, you know, if we can, you know, we have some of this bio clustering and things like that, but everybody doesn't have to use it. Um, you know, I'm not making, oh, I, I don't know. No, you well, can't, but, um, but to simply say we're going to install large ground mounted solar in as much forest land, let's get it on the farms. Let's get it. Let's really encourage it where it causes less damage. Could we could we take Mandy's addition, which is and significantly increasing the installation? Can we just say of large and small solar and other renewable energy production? systems and that starts to in recognize that we or say that we recognize it's going to be an array of things that are that are needed i don't know i think it's a better sentence without that because it's embedded in there but uh i will we're not voting we're that's just fine. that's fine yeah Pat, you want to keep going? Uh, I guess so. <laughs> uh, wait, wait. Scroll Unless... down. Scroll down. <laughs> All right. There's, you know, there's a lot of changes in here. Um, let me see. Well, for so in the next paragraph, for our soils are if we go into, um, in addition, to cross out in a, in addition, minimizing disturbance of. Forest soils will help to minimize erosion and sedimentation. And then uh, I'm in the right place. Yeah. And so here, the extreme weather is keeping, we're keeping this. I'm keeping it. <laughs> and then um, Uh, so this paragraph in recent years, you know, the recent survey conducted, I think that paragraph can be removed. Can I can I ask while you're on this topic, can we add the words climate resilience as the as the heading for this new section? Uh, we can. Yeah, I'm not going to comment on that right now. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I see what you're doing. OK. Um, trying to. The natural like filtering. Let me see where I am. I'm sorry, folks, that this is. Uh, it is tough. Yeah, okay. Um, so then at this point, I wanted to, I took out this next paragraph and actually want, because I've combined the two nexus statements. And it should, what I'd like it to say is to junk it, to get rid of. Um, 
this in a recent survey, the next power, therefore the town, uh, and not get rid of therefore the town, but move productive farmland. You yeah, eliminate that paragraph. And then move productive farmland up or take therefore the town and put that underneath the farm statement. So can I ask why we even need this therefore statement at all? I thought that was the point of a nexus is that you that you make the direct connection and the direct statement. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's, it seems it's sort circular. Of, it's, We're in a bylaw regulating these. So I, I don't know. It seems circular. I'll, I'll move it to Pat. You wanted it. Yeah. Hold on. Hold on. I can't. <laughs> Hold on. Let me put it down there because you wanted it down there to start with. Um, I had a question about the paragraph before. The recent survey? No, the this this one here. Yeah, I have some thoughts on that too. Go ahead, Min Mandy. Yeah, um, if we're trying to, as Pat said, combine these into more general and not necessarily like this one's under sort of climate resilience and all and not just forest. And I know this was written as as a forest section and a farmland section, but um forests aren't the only thing that provide critical wildlife habitat. Um forests I know are the, the grass only thing that act as natural filters. <laughs> That's not a fact. Um, you know, there, there's other things that act as, uh, you know, meadows act as natural filters. Meadows provide wildlife habitat right. corridors and aid in biodiversity. Like, like I, I guess this gets into part of some of my issues with a nexus statement to begin with, um, because it seems to imply forests are the only thing that do this, and they're not. Before. <laughs> so in my ver in my version, I I didn't try to merge. I the farmland actually came in more at the end under the economy topic. Um, but in terms of in terms of active for forest land is is more of the filter, more of the buffer, more of the protection of the soil than agricultural land typically. You could have hay one year, you can plow it for corn the next. So it's it's not, um, you could say meadows, sorry, had a moth. Meadows um, can, you know, are important. Um, I think right very now, specifically, I mean, you have a point, Mandy, but I think very specifically maintaining um, healthy forests um, is critical. And it doesn't mean that you can't have some solar uh, installations in forests, but there need to really be the reason that we have our proposing limitations or regulations is because of the importance of forests. Uh, in doing this and maintaining sediment. You know, maybe we could work in here hillside forests and 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 uh, meadows or, um, you know, but I don't know. So Go it's ahead, not Mandy. just you climate resilience raised. in general. I'm sorry, what? The, the title of this one that, that Pam asked us to put in was climate resilience, but that's not what this yeah, well, I'm not. Um, that's not something we voted on. That no, was, I know. I'm. I. I yeah. But but you know whether it's forest climate resilience or forest health or I I don't know. It seems like that's not really the right title for this section. If we're well, it was for now. <laughs> it was nexus statement regarding special requirements for LGPIs on farmland and forest lands. That's what we're talking about here. Um, we're really talking right, about- but, but the climate resilience with this title of climate resilience, that's not what this paragraph is. Well, then I think it's, we it's should- It's specific to forests, not general climate resilience. 
It is specific to forests, correct. That's why it's under this topic. Well, the topic is forests and farmland. See, right here it says forest, um, forests play a vital role in climate resilience. Um, so as in, perhaps it should say, uh, and then that should be first and we get, and then as extreme weather increases, blah, blah, blah. So play, move forests play a vital role in climate resilience. And I don't think you need the separate climate resilience. Uh, I, I'm going to make a suggestion. Let's take the word climate, I mean, forest off that topic, because I think we can we can make it address both. And if we could go to the second paragraph, and that is New England has experienced increase, increased heavy rainfall events. River flooding often doesn't have anything to do with the hillside. <laughs> um, hillside forests retain rainfall and slow the release of water into streams and rivers, period. Or acting as natural filters. <laughs> acting as natural filters, increasing infiltration, increasing infiltration of the water into the soil and minimizing sheet flow. All that stays the same. Um, I really you, think. Were you in a separate sentence with that? Uh, let's see. For hillside forests retain waterfall rainfall and slow the release of water into the forest buffers. Act as natural filters. Slowing in uh, increasing infiltration of the water. Not, I think not slowing. No, they increase sorry. the infiltration. And the rest is is fine. Um, I don't think we need the paragraph about the natural filtering helps protect water supply. Uh, yeah, actually we do we do. Excuse me. Uh, after resilience in the first sentence, I think we can just move New England right there up there. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, and it has no cipher. Where? <laughs> right up here. Uh, I'm pointing with my pointer as if you can see it. <laughs> as if I can see it. <laughs> After the word resilience and the period, take a space and then stick New England there. Right here. Oh, no, I, I have it, just won't show it. It oh. will be one paragraph. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's just, it won't show it in this full full track changes version, but I have deleted that. Okay, hang on. So it's one full paragraph here. Let me see. One paragraph. That's fine. Pat, so, did you have did you have other it's natural fill? I um this particularly for Amherst residents reliant on private wells. Um, there's far more Amherst residents that rely on public water supplies than private wells. I would get rid of that aside. Yeah. It's important for all. You know what? This is supplies. like insane. <laughs> I want to go back. I, I really can't even tell where we are. Okay. Yeah. Because the, this. Um, it basic hillside forests can slow the release of water. Um, they slowing infiltration. It, we're really talking about slowing, not increasing infiltration of the water. That's no, you, what the soil is doing. It's acting. You as a want spin. the soil to actually the water to actually go into the soil, not roll down into the stream. Correct. So you don't want it to slow going into the soil. You want it to right. sneak. Okay. Into the soil. All right. <laughs> And slowing in minimum. Okay. And so, Pat, we're taking the, we're taking the changes that you suggested in your. I know, and then changing them, and, and I'm having trouble following you. That's right, and we're 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 all of us are kind of weighing in with other yep. little ideas. Yep, yep. So I get that. Okay. So I would, delete but I can't keep that. Pardon me. I would delete what I've sort of highlighted. Uh -uh. No, because. 
it's protecting both private and public, and the particularly one seems to imply that it's more important to protect private than public water sources. And in it's many ways, to protect both. Yeah. I think that there's still, a, you know, yes, it protects both, but in terms of private wells, they're they're more deeply affected, perhaps. Uh, they can be affected more quickly than the larger public system. So I think that needs to be there. I think your perhaps is the problem. We can't be guessing in a statement like this. Natural valves. Well, I would say then both private wells and public water supplies because... There you go. Yeah, that's good. Good. So let me ask another question. The last sentence here, the habitat, wildlife habitat and corridors. I, I wanna state, I don't disagree with the sentence, but to me, it has nothing to do with public health, safety and welfare as it relates to regulating solar. In the general, this is this is what goes back to when I said when we're stretching the meaning of public health, safety, and welfare. Um, I think this is a statement that stretches that meaning of the typical meaning when someone says what's public health, safety, and welfare. People don't think wildlife habitat. That's the problem. <laughs> Well, but, <laughs> but that's where I say we're stretching it to be able to regulate something we shouldn't be regulating. Well, except we talk in the bylaw about um, wildlife habitat. We talk about um, um, native plants and things like that. We, you know, we talk about uh, those things. So I don't know if it's so much of a stretch. Um, I, I will be moving the, to remove you know, some and, of those discussions when we get down to those sections of the bylaw. Uh, <laughs> you know, the protect preservation of biodiversity is critical. And Jennifer. our buildings, the way we build as a as a country, the way we build housing and things like that, ignores that kind of biodiversity. And I think right. that potentially it really is important that wildlife can move freely in some set, except maybe the bears in my neighborhood. Uh, no, they're good. They're good. Yeah, no, I know. Uh, Jennifer. So, no, but isn't a nexus statement, uh, it, wouldn't this be appropriate, the nexus state yeah. statement be an appropriate place for this to be? I, so I think it's different than the rest of the bylaw. I mean, it's stating a statement of values. But it's not supposed to be a statement of values. Bylaws. No, but is can't the nexus statement, isn't that what the your it's kind of the aspirational part? I don't know. That's probably the wrong word of the bylaw. I mean, not all bylaws have nexus statements, but I think I, I, think I, I sorry, sorry. No, Pat. go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say I've taken KP Law's opinions when I've talked to them at MMA conferences and all regarding this as a means of connecting the regulations in the bylaw to health, safety, and welfare because the law only allows you to regulate solar for health, safety, and general public welfare. And so you have to connect your regulations to that. It's not a statement of values. It's 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 right. that that nexus right. in between. Right. How does this X how does X regulation connect to the general health, safety, or welfare of the public? And wildlife habitat and corridors, to me, well, we don't regulate it in any other manner of the zoning bylaw. And so I don't see why solar is different. I, I'm going to go, Pat, with the, the large scale subdivisions that might cut down well more than one acre of land. And this starts at about one acre of land regulation. Disrupt 
wildlife habitats just as much, but we don't say you can't do that. And but so maybe we should. Solar different. <laughs> but what makes solar different? And I just, th this sentence to me is not one that, while I agree with that criticalness, um, sorry, the recreational opportunities and relaxation, we're talking about private land, not public land. And I am not yeah. entitled to recreate on someone else's land. We're not just talking about public private land here. I think you make some good points, Mandy. Um, Let's leave it in and come back to it. I want to keep going and finish this section before um just put it yeah put a highlight on it or something yeah do, yeah there we go revisit thank you good um and then if what i've done in mine is remove nexus statement for farmland and keep the paragraph uh productive farmland is a finite resource um blah 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 and I think items uh, one oh, and oh, wait, two. Wait a second. Productive farmland is a finite resource access. And so here's where I, yeah, I've cut, I've moved like the key principles and things like that to farm farmland, um, not in the nexus statement. Um, and so, yeah. Pat, excuse me. What do you mean you moved it to farmland? Okay, there is a section where we talk, I talk about uh, requirements on farmland and forested lands. And so though I moved the, the uh, so cross out nexus statement, you did that. And then, uh, let me see. What I'd like to have here is um, access to, to cut this for now, Access to locally grown food is important for the health and welfare. Uh, where are we? Of residents or of Amherst residents, but residents, much of, uh, and then let me see. Here it is. Period. I, it's very hard for me to follow this. I'm sorry. So you're, yeah, you're going to eliminate that. Yeah. And uh, so then I have uh, you might extreme have weather that. events. Let me see. Yeah. Extreme weather events can threaten farmland and crop yields after welfare of residents. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the future welfare. Therefore, as a new paragraph. Yeah, that's on the next page. Okay. Yeah, it's hard for me to see. Yes, yeah. I would suggest in, as we go forward, if people have um, ideas about where to move a paragraph or two to make note of it, um, rather than having the, the paragraph appear magically somewhere new. <laughs> so, that, so that it's easier to follow where the paragraphs are being moved to. Okay, well, right now, with my, the, this is where, how I would like this section to now read. And instead of, well, one more thing. Where are we? So we eliminated all of the community values So this is yeah. this is how it reads per Pat's request. And I'm and I I'm did asking... it this way so that people can see what it yeah. looks like. I can go back so that people can see what was deleted. All right. Thanks, Mandy. Do people want me to go back so people can see? Yeah. 
It's just there's a lot of red. So yep. Yep. And things got moved around. Um, I was going to to add the category of economics. So we have we have community values, which appear to have been deleted. We had se carbon sequestration, climate resilience. So these are the four the four categories of consideration. When I think of health, safety, and welfare, I think of those as they apply to forest and farmlands. So in in front of the word productive farmland, I would say economics. And that may be the wrong title, but I was going to say, how does economics relate to health, safety, and welfare? <laughs> it's welfare. <laughs> it's the welfare part of it. Okay. And I would actually like to keep the uh, the reference to the soil, the digital soil maps by NRC, and that where they can be found, because I think that's a key component. If someone says, you know, you can't build on prime soils, you can't build in Biomap three. Uh, forests, they need to know what those are. So I think so that, so there Pat, are reference I mean, down in definitions. Right. But de yeah, and definitions, definitions moved, put that but, link yeah. in there. It's the same link. Okay. So can I ask a question about this modified paragraph? Yes. Sure. I appreciate I appreciate the removal of all of the mentions of local businesses and all. Um, it was one of my big concerns um, as inappropriate for a zoning bylaw. Um, but we have a lot of generalities uh, that seem self-serving to a nexus statement. And I want to be clear that it's not necessarily that I disagree with a statement per se, um, but I feel like we're saying it just so we can regulate stuff um, where there could be disagreement. And I'm not wording this this well, but extreme, you know, and, and let, let's take extreme weather events can threaten farmland and crop yields. Well, they threaten well more than farmland and crop yields. They, you know, it goes back to my thing with forests, right? Extreme weather events threaten a whole lot of stuff and solar development hopefully will help lessen them. Um, access to locally grown food is important for the public health and welfare of residents. Um, Yes, but is it related to solar development? It's it's Not related. To, it's related to sustainability. Well, um, yeah, I guess this is where I'm I'm struggling with the nexus statement. You know, and extreme weather events can threaten farmland and crop yields. Thus, preservation of local farmland is vital to our future welfare. Those two statements don't really go together. <laughs> Um, Chris, you have your hand I think up. there's a connection here between the um, requirement to use agrivoltaics right. on certain types of farmland if you're going to um, have solar arrays installed on them. And um, you, that comes later in the bylaw, but the connection is, yes, we want to preserve farmland, and when we install solar on farmland, we want to make a good effort to have agrivoltaics as part of it. And so we want to be able to have a statement here that supports that requirement. So I think that's how this evolved. That helps. No. Yeah. Also I in terms of extreme weather and forests and <laughs> the uh, Army Corps of Engineers is going to be working on the Connecticut uh, River watershed and by planting trees to control flooding and to help filter contaminants and excess sediment. So those are jobs being done by hillside forests. So those are real things that forests do to help protect the water supply. And I think they belong in the nexus statement. 
I'm not disagreeing. I'm I'm wondering how you've got two sent one sentence here that says extreme weather events threaten farmland, thus preservation of farmland is vital for our future welfare. It doesn't quite go together. That's one sentence. Yeah, yeah. No, I yeah, I see the clunkiness of it. Extreme weather events can threaten farmland and crop yields. I mean, is that the phrasing? What you're trying to say is because so much threatens the farmland, we have to do everything we can to help protect right. and preserve it. I mean, is that what you're, is that what we're trying to say? The I think so, yeah. The original sentence said the town of Amherst established requirements regarding the installation of LGPIs on prime farmland and farmland of statewide importance. We're recognizing that we're, we are going to regulate, and but we're going to regulate under these conditions where we are overlapping with prime for, farmland and So it's quarter after eight. I'm going to, um, let's see, we are, <laughs> we are, I think we have sort of worked this section to, to, um, we'll come back to it. Exactly. Um, I want to do two things. Um, actually, I'd like to just stop this conversation now. So this is a really good time to do it. Um, I, I'm looking at the the rest of the agenda. I do want to talk about um, future agenda items, and at the moment, um, I did put in the I did put in the agenda that we would have com public comments specifically on the solar bylaw topics. I did not say at the beginning of the meeting when, so I apologize about that. Um, I'm going to open up to public comments for two minutes, and then we are going to move directly to uh, approval of minutes and the next agenda uh, item so that we can finish up on time. Anybody in the audience who feels they need to speak is welcome to raise their hand. If not, we'll continue what we're doing. I see Mr. Roof, Hampshire College has raised his hand. Mr. Roof, can you give your name and address? And uh, you have two minutes. Great, thank you. This is Steve Roof. Um, I live in South Amherst, and I'm speaking here as my own person, I'm not for Hampshire College. Um, thank you for so much work that you're doing on this. It's a colossal job. I would like, when you guys submit your revised draft up to the full council, I would really like to see documentation that explains what was deleted in the C by the CRC from the original um, draft produced by the Solar Bylaw Bylaw Working Group? What was deleted? What was moved? What was condensed? And most importantly, explanations and justifications for any requirements that were changed from that draft that was voted on by the Solar Bylaw Working Group. You know, those could be things, changes to buffer distance, and or any new requirements that were inserted by this CRC group. So that way we can. Uh, citizens can see how it has changed and why it has changed from what the Solar Bylaw Working Group um, ha had added. Um, and then as far as the nexus statement goes, oh boy, um, I think you've got a colossal problem there. Um, <clears throat> let me just say this nexus statement um, just incompletely and greatly misrepresents Massachusetts state law and the decarbonization plans. By only focusing on decarbonization, um, it's just, it's just, it's just not accurate. It, and um, sure, you could talk about de, uh, carbon sequestration all you want, but just remember, carbon sequestration by forest is about 7% of our annual emissions. So only 7% of the carbon we put in by burning fossil fuels gets sucked up by forests. So we really, really need to stop polluting the air with carbon pollution. And to do that, Massachusetts says we're gonna stop 95% of fossil fuel combustion by 2050. Um, we really have to stop polluting. We cannot rely on forests to be that tiny little sponge to suck up carbon. I think you ultimately just going to need to greatly shorten and reduce this nexus statement, not try to twist yourself in knots to cherry picking bits and pieces of Massachusetts plans to justify restrictions on solar development. Um, so thank good luck with much. that. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Appreciate it. 
Martha Hanner. Thank you. Martha Hanner from South Amherst speaking as an individual climate scientist who I was dealing with solar panels 40 years ago on our spacecraft. I would like to respond to uh, Steve Roof's comments. Uh, first of all, regarding the uh, <clears throat> CO2 emissions, the biggest factor statewide by far is transportation. We need to stop driving. Uh, electricity, yes, that's going to rise as we have uh, more electric vehicles, but that's a slow process. Right now, uh, electricity generation is providing only a small percentage of the CO2 emissions, whether it's you know from the remaining natural gas. It's the conversion of uh, you know stopping driving and um, conversion of our home and building heating systems and cooling systems that's uh, the bigger concerns. And the documentation by the state is that right now, um, as Steve did say, that uh, our natural lands are producing maybe, uh, sequestering maybe five to 7%. And the plots clearly show in the state plans that we need 15% uh, carbon sequestration in order to balance out and get to net zero uh, by 2050. That is part of the state plan. Carbon sequestration is very important. And now that our, there's droughts in the Amazon and our uh, tropical forests, both the Amazon and in Africa and in Indonesia are getting destroyed by fire and mining. And um, Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Uh, that you it, yes. So uh, carbon sequestration is, in fact, a very important part of um, our controlling emissions. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks to both of you. OK, we are changing subjects. And we are on to approval of minutes. We still had just the one set of minutes from April 9, 2024. Is, would anyone like to make a motion to approve or amend those? I move that we approve the minutes from April, whatever it is. April 9. Any second? Second. Thank you. I'm going to just go in order. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Councillor Ette. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. So minutes are approved as of whatever today is, September 24. Uh, hopefully we'll get the rest of those minutes later. Uh, any announcements? Next agenda preview, we heard last night. Oops, sorry. Oh. Got to be quick. And I noticed there was a letter from ECAC with an annual report. I wasn't sure if the report was meant for the committee first, or it's supposed to go directly to the council. I didn't see. I, I don't know what you're referring to. Are you liaison to that committee? Yes, I am liaison to that okay. committee. Oh. Yeah. I think it should be forwarded to the president for forwarding to the full council. Okay. Oh, I didn't realize it was a question. Good. Thank you. Um, next agenda preview, solar, uh, excuse me, um, solar by law. Presumably we will continue. We need to talk about how we want to split our time, and then the university drive overlay that was forward to us last night, um, but it obviously wasn't going to get on tonight's agenda. Mandy. Um, with that overlay, when do you plan on doing the hearing or noticing? The I hearing haven't before? decided yet. Okay. I looked at, I haven't decided. I did a timeline and it's pretty rough. I want to talk to Chris 
and or uh, the planning board to find out what is works with their schedule. Um, obviously, as you noted in the in the referral memo or motion that um, it has to be opened by Thanksgiving, essentially. Um, the planning board may have time in its agenda to do it sooner. Uh, I think one of my considerations is as we as we want to pack up the solar bylaw and get it in a in decent shape, we also have to have a public hearing for that. So I am I want to, you know, feedback is welcome. Um, but I think it would be I think it makes sense and I I would like to hear some feedback on on the the structure of having planning board and CRC public hearing at the same time I frankly would love to hear feedback and a presentation from the planning board I know they've already done done this gone through it but I would like to have that as part of my consideration when I sit down to go through what I am hearing from the public and the and the the hearing input. So that's part of the conversation about timing. If people have thoughts, you're very welcome to write to me or call me or whatever so that we can hash that out. So I think that's a really good topic to discuss as we start the conversation next time on on the U drive and I I'm looking at Chris um hoping that maybe Chris is still involved or if not if it's probably going to be Nate because he's been the one uh presenting this material but I would I will I'll sort of put on her on her desk for the for the next couple days um if we could get some feedback from planning board on the convenience and timing of a hearing for them. Um, so the planning board isn't meeting until October 16th. Oh, okay. I think it's going to be up to staff to make um, some decisions with the planning board chair about when the uh, public hearing would be opened. Um, and maybe this is a good time to explain my situation. Is it a good time? Sure. So I'm retiring as of Friday. Um, and I am I need to disappear for a month. I need to disappear for the month of October. And then I hope to be able to come back in November to work part-time, probably half, half-time, um, to work with Stephanie on the solar bylaw and work on a number of other things. There hasn't been an official, what should I say, announcement or document or anything to that effect, but I've been talking to Dave Zomick about this and I think that he is um, in agreement that that would be useful for me to come back. So I'm essentially gonna be gone for a month, like I'm on vacation <laughs> and I'll be back half time in November, but I'll be supporting Nate and, um, the members of the planning board and Pam as they uh, set the schedule for planning board. Um, and we'll try to talk about that in the next couple of days. I'll try to talk about that with Nate and Pam tomorrow. Okay. And, um, yeah. So that's just wanted to let you know what right. my situation is. And, and so it may be then if, if the, and I assume that the planning board has an agenda for the October 16 meeting. So it's not, um, so we'll have to come to, we'll have to come to some agreement on, on even a date because our meeting dates are different and we don't want to necessarily impose on the planning board something that's just simply more convenient for CRC. Are you saying that you want to have a joint public hearing? Not necessarily. What are you saying exactly? Um, what am I saying? Um, it would be helpful to know if and when the planning board has the availability to hold a public hearing. I assume that that would typically be on their meeting date so that they don't have to have a special date. Mm -hmm. We, we CRC also has to hold a public hearing on this topic. Um, and both of us before Thanksgiving. 
they certainly do not have to be on the same evening. And I might welcome feedback that, that I hear during the planning board commentary uh, in making my decisions about this bylaw. So I'm not in a rush to hear, you know, to, to consolidate it because I think hearing multiple input is, is sometimes valuable. Does that, does that clarify it? So are you saying that you would like it if the planning board public hearing was opened early and whether it's continued or not, you would be able to hear some of their conversation about, about it? I personally, I personally would be sitting in the audience listening to that conversation. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's definitely not, you know, necessary to force it along. Um, it has to happen before Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. All right. I will pass that information along. Any other comments from, oh, Athena. Just a quick note, if I may, to be aware of the notice requirements for those public hearings. Um, so uh, while Chris is away, and thank you so much, Chris, for your willingness to come back and continue working <laughs> with us on this. I don't know what we do uh, if you just disappeared <laughs> forever. Yeah, so really. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, but uh, I'd like to make sure to work with the committee on those notice requirements. We need to publish notice in the newspaper um, in advance of the hearings. And that's a much longer notice period than the 48 hours for meeting postings. Um, and then we also need to send notices to DHCD and neighboring towns. And there's a list of notices that need to go out. So I wanna make sure that you're aware of those um, notice requirements before you set a date so that we can be sure that the publication dates line up. Okay, and what is the time frame? Uh, I think it has to be posted at least 14 days before the before the hearing in any case mm -hmm. it's uh two consecutive weeks and i think the first one is at least 14 days before the hearing but you know you can't publish a notice in the newspaper the same day the newspaper runs so we need to make sure that we have those deadlines the newspaper deadlines um i can communicate with you about where when the deadlines are and so forth to make sure that we get those done in time but i want to make sure that you're aware that we, we need to plan ahead a little bit and yeah. make sure that we're checking all the boxes. Yes. Thank you. Mandy. The SharePoint folder has draft timelines for public hearings that will help you go through all of that with how long it takes to do all of it. Yep. Thank you very much. Super. So that's uh, obviously we have work cut out for us for next for, for October. It's already October. Uh, it is 8.33. I um, do not have any other items uh, um, 48 hours in advance. And I think if there is no reason not to, I would like to see us adjourn. I'll make that motion. Thank you. And I'll, I'll second, second it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go around. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Farke Ette. Aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Pam Rooney, aye. We are adjourned at, at 8.34. Thank you very much. And again, Chris, thank you. Thank you from the yeah, bottom Chris of our hearts. Chris and heart. Stephanie. Yeah. And yeah. Steph, um, she's but next. Applause but... <laughs> for Chris. <laughs> well, I'm so glad it's not goodbye. <laughs> I know. I know. Me this too. <laughs> Really? There was an old um, song I used to hear when I was younger by a country western group, and it was, how can you miss me if I won't go away? <laughs> or, <laughs> no, or something like that. How can I miss you if you won't go away? So, <laughs> well, you're going away for a going, month. Yeah. Yes, enjoy. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. We're, we're adjourning. Thank, Thank you. Chris. Thank you. Good night, everybody. And thank you, Athena. See you, Chris. Stephanie. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Good night.